Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by Funkinstuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at Funkinstuff.net on YouTube. Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go in its audio podcast edition from Funkinstuff.net, iTunes, and other leading providers. I'm Scott Dr. J.X. Goldfein, musicologist and author of Everything's on the One, the first guy to funk. If you don't have your copy, you better get on Amazon quickly and get a copy. Whether you're watching or listening, I thank you as always very much for tuning in and for your continued interest and support. My guest today is Patrice Chocolate Banks, the original lead female singer and percussionist for Graham Central Station. Led by former Sly and Family Stone slap bat bass uh, pioneer Larry Graham, there ain't no bow to doubt it that GCFs, the self proclaimed baddest group from east to west, was one of the down and dirtiest funk bands of the 1970s. I'm here to tell you that as hot as Graham and the rest of the group's players were, chocolate, soulful, sultry, and sassy vocalizing was as key to the band's sound and success as any other ingredient. One of my favorite performances of hers was the Taking It to the Church interpretation of Ann Peebles' I Can't Stand the Rain from my all-time top GCS album, 1975's landmark funk LP, Ain't No Bow to Doubt It. That album kicks off with the full throttle funk assault of the jam, in which Ms. Banks tantalizingly introduces herself as C-H-O-C-L-E-T, chocolate. Of course, I don't do that justice. Hopefully we'll hear it from the source soon enough, but um, she was also up front on that record's number one R&B hit, Your Love. And among the other hits and fantastic tracks GCS produced during their sweetest chocolate period that encompassed the band's first four albums from 1974 to 1976 was Release Yourself, Can You Handle It, Feel the Need, It's All Right, Intro, Love Covers a Multitude of Sin, I Believe in You, Hair, Water, Ghetto, and so many others. Ain't done yet. In the late 1970s, Chocolate struck out on her own and went on to provide background vocals for numerous artists and released a solo album in 1980 called She's Back and Ready. Some of the other acts that she has performed or recorded with include B.B. King, Stephanie Mills, Reby Jackson, Shaka Khan, Wayne Henderson and the Crusaders, Ronnie Laws, Dr. Dre, and Rose Royce. More recently, Chocolate has written two books, A Chocolate State of Mind and Deja, v uh, Deja View, that can be a tongue twister, Memoirs of a Funk Diva. She's also teamed with Ronald Stozo the Clown Edwards, best known for his album cover artwork for P-Funk and other artists, to spearhead a move called Funk Illusion which aims to give more attention to the funk music genre and elevate it to the level of respect and acclaim it so richly deserves. And I'm not a political guy, but that is a cause that I'm fully behind because it's what inspired me to write my book and to do this show. So I'm down with funk illusion. With all that said, it is my distinct honor and delight to welcome officially Patrice Chocolate Banks to Truth and Rhythm. Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing very well. Better now that I'm talking to you. Okay. Uh, so you want me to do the, uh, my name is C-H-O-C-L-E-T right now? Let's hear it. Okay. My name is C-H-O-C-L-E-T, Chocolate. Ah, love it. That's how you do it. So you, you can practice and next time <laughs> we'll do it together. We'll do a duet. All right. I don't think I'll ever get it to that level, but uh, thank you for that. <laughs> So you're coming to us from Los Angeles, right? Yes. Well, a little outside of Los Angeles, but yes, I was raised um, in Los Angeles. Uh huh. And um, um, I'm also from LA. I don't know if you knew that, but right, you told me that because because your phone number I rec recognized the area code. Yeah, yeah, I held on to that. So mm -hmm. uh, I am definitely LA LA boy. That's why the Lakers. Exactly. Yeah, Me, die hard Laker fan, die hard. So, did you uh, did you grow up in Los Angeles? Yeah, born and raised. Yeah, I, I moved about uh, ten years ago. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Well, very good. Then we don't, you know, we we, we are uh, soul brothers and sisters when it comes to that. Right, that die hard Laker fan. I don't care what happens. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? I just don't care. I'm waiting on a uh, homeboy to get his act together. We've been waiting on him. You know, I'm talking about the the young boy. The rookie, yeah. Yeah, what's his name? Ball. 
Yeah, yeah. right. Let me get together so we can get some more championships. Yeah, we got to be patient right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Been patient for a while. That's true. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, um, were you with um, Grand Central Station when they did that reunion in the mid seventies? They played a House of Blues gig. You were at that show, right? Yes. I that was ninety five. That was ninety five, ninety six. Exactly. So, I was at that show. It was unbelievable, and. Um, I have this, which I got backstage and I talked to Larry at the show and he signed this and I actually had him sign the first three albums. Um, well, no, I brought Mirrors, I brought um, Ain't No Bout It, Doubt It, and that one and signed them all. So. Grand Blues Station. Yeah. Those were the best, well, there was there was uh, Grand Central Station, Ain't No Bout It, Doubt It, Mirror, and Release Yourself. You didn't have Release Yourself? I didn't have that with me. No, I took the other three. Yeah, yeah. So those are, are the best Graham Central Station albums. Oh, no question about it. We'll get more into that for sure. But In my humble opinion. Hey, no argument here. <laughs> so, Patrice, let's uh, jump in with, you know, um, where you grew up, how you grew up, how you got into music, and um, let's let's talk about your humble beginnings a little bit. Okay, well, I was born in Texas, a little town called Tyler, Texas, East Texas. And um, the way I um, became interested in music was because my father was a Baptist preacher. And um, so I was in the choir, like the little bitty children's choir and all that. And my first experience with singing was um, an Easter program in my father's church. I sang, Yes, Jesus Loves Me. And the the reception i got i don't know it was because i was the preacher's daughter <laughs> i'm not sure what it was but the people the looks on their faces and they were clapping and smiling and something just clicked right there and i just knew that you know i had to do that again you know so i could get the same response it was like you know overwhelming so i've been doing it ever since uh, i did not miss any chance to sing at my father's church after that for any reason so that's how i got started and um then moved out to los angeles like when i was about five years old and just in school uh anything that had to do with music i was there i was doing it um choirs orchestra my first instrument was the cello you know just anything that had to do with music i was just, that as a matter of fact that's the only way i probably graduated from school is because music kept me in school to be honest with you <laughs> you know being involved in all the uh, choirs and chamber singers and all that that's what kept me interested in school so that's the beginning my first influences i remember um is Mahalia Jackson and Elvis Presley. I remember those two, you know, in the beginning of knowing what other people sounded like when they sang, Mahalia Jackson, because my mother listened to her, and Elvis Presley because, you know, he was on TV all the time and he was the closest thing that I found to what it was that I felt when I was singing, like he was doing a heat. I thought he had what we now call soul, I guess. It was something that spoke to me about the sound of his voice, the way he moved all that. So those were the first two. Mm -hmm. so, so did you ever have any, uh, you know, sort of stage fright or performance anxiety or where you just kind of took right to it? Um, in the beginning, no. But now, believe it or not, I still experience a uh, stage fright. Like I get very nervous before it's time for me to walk out on stage. But in the very beginning, no, no problem whatsoever. Hmm. Sounds like you were precocious. That's a good word, but uh, yeah, I would say so. I would say I was precocious, yeah. yeah. Because you know, I was a I was a my father was a preacher, so I got a lot of attention. You know what I'm saying? From because he wasn't married, from all the sisters that were trying to, you know, get next to him through being nice to me. You know how that goes. So yeah, I like attention. So I guess yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So <clears throat> when when did you uh, did you do any uh, recording before you met Larry Graham? What what happened between you know 
kind of, you know, taking music in school and, and meeting Larry and, and getting any sort of professional level involvement? Okay. Well, yes. Um, so when I was in high school, these uh, people came to my school and they were auditioning for a group. They were the managers and the so on and so forth of a group called the Doodle Town Pipers. So I uh, sang Natural Woman and um, I got the audition. So as soon as I graduated from high school, I joined this group, the Dual Town Pipers. Now the Dual Town Pipers was like an all American type group. There was another group called the Young Americans who uh, were our, uh, you know, competition. So um, as soon as I graduated, maybe about two or three months after I graduated, I went on the road with the Dual Town Pipers and um, we played in Vegas a lot opening up Vegas was totally different than it is now, opening up for big name acts, you know, in lounges and sometimes in the bigger rooms. We also did a TV series. We did all the holiday series. We did uh, Ed Sullivan. Remember Ed Sullivan? Uh, yeah. I was just watching a clip the other day, actually, of when Sly Stone was on there. Okay, yeah. so uh, we did Ed Sullivan two or three times. So I, I traveled all around the United States with the Dual Town Pipers, and um, that was my first professional um, experience. Before that, I was just, I had my own bands in high school. So I was uh, singing locally and performing with my band locally here, and you know, in LA. We were called the New Perspectives. So I, I had been doing that for a while, but the Dual Town Pipers was my first professional gig. So um, we were at the Frontier Hotel and um, opening up for, uh, can't remember who, but the Supremes came to see us. They were in town also, Diana Ross was with them. And so they came to just hang out and see us. I guess they were just trying to wind down, you know what I'm saying? So Dick Griffey was their road manager at the time. So after we did our little gig, um, after it was over with, Dick Griffey came backstage and invited everybody who wanted to go to come to this set over uh, this after party um, at Caesars Palace over in his room. So we did. We all went over there. We were shocked to death. We couldn't believe it. This Diane was there. The other Supremes were there. We were hanging out, having a good time. So Dick Griffey approached me. For those who don't know who Dick Griffey is, he was um, the founder of Solar Records. So he approached me and said that, you know, he liked my energy and he liked my voice and that, you know, if I ever wanted to leave the situation I was in to give him a call. And so about six or seven months later, I did that. I quit um, the Doodle Town Pipers and he was one of the first people I called. He became my manager, um, got back together with my high school band, The New Perspectives, and he was also promoting at the time. So one of the first gigs he was promoting was um, a gig at the forum. The Young Rascals were the headliners. Sly and the Family Stone were the special guests. And so I begged Dick to please let my group open up. He did. So we opened up and we were the opening act. And after the uh, show was over, I was hanging around. I asked Dick to please introduce me to everybody in Sly and the Family Stone because I was an avid Sly and the Family Stone fan. I had everything they had ever done. Um, I love Sly the most. Larry was second and then everybody else after that. But I have to say that I really admired Rose and Cynthia because they were doing something that I had never seen before. The positions that they were holding in that band, I had never seen that before. Women actually a part of the band you know, as opposed to just being girls singing doo-wop behind somebody. So they were actually a part of the band. It was like, okay, that's for me. This is what I have to do. So Dick um, introduced me to Larry. Larry and I uh, hooked up, hooked up as in there was another party at the hotel afterwards. And I went to that. And uh, the rest is history. After that, um, we became a couple. And he was living in Oakland at the time. I moved up to Oakland and traveled on the road with him with, while he was still with Sly for about a year and a half. So 
Chocolate, what year was that about when you uh, met them and you were the fan and, and, and that happened? Uh, I'm not good at years. 72, maybe, something like that? 70 yeah, 70 something. <laughs> <laughs> I was just. I was, do you do you remember which Sly album was out at the time? That that can help. Was I? Oh, I know exactly what it was. <laughs> I know what it was. I'm okay. just not, you know, a big fan of. Uh, okay, I got you. Like I got you. Okay. So, but it was the early seventies, as you know. Yes. 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 The golden uh, era for um, funk, for sure. Exactly. Okay, so you connected with Larry, and then he's still in Sly. So what was it like for you being in that camp? What was the Sly and the Family Stone camp like at that time? We've heard so many stories. It sounds you know, kind of scandalous in a lot of accounts. What was it like being next to that? I'm going to tell you one thing, Scott. It was magical. And, of course, now that I look back at it, I really know. And, and the only thing that I really regret is the fact that I did. And I'm a picture taker. I always had my camera with me. Not before the phones. You know, I always had a camera. And so I never did take pictures, you know, because everything was moving so fast anyway. But that's the thing I regret the most, not, being, not having pictures. But it was... A, First of all, I was very young. So just to be around Sly and Family Stone, because I, when I tell you I was the, an avid fan, like I was like, it was like surreal for me just to be around them, you know? So I was very shy because I was young. I was shy. I was, I was afraid to like, really, I didn't want to impose. I didn't want anybody to uh, really, uh, I was trying to be invisible is what I was really trying to do because I just felt so out of my element because I was so young, but um, the starstruck but, right? and that too. And the fact that I was with Larry too, you know, you know, out of all the women in the world he could be with, you know, he had chosen me for whatever reason. So, so I was just happy just to be in the whole situation. And yeah, there were a lot of things that happened because, um, you know, as you know, drugs was deeply rooted in the music industry, period. And at that time, cocaine was really prevalent. So cocaine is the reason that um, Sly and the Family Stone headed, you know, on a down, downward spiral because of the use of it. And um, so I saw a lot of dark things, which disappointed me because, you know, I just wanted I just knew how wonderful they were and what and what they brought and how they had changed music. So to see that kind of like, you know, like crumble in front of my face, that was very disgusting. But before that started to happen, I was just traveling around the world, going to Europe. Um, we did, I went with them when they did the Isle of Wight, which was like a, a Woodstock but only in uh, Europe. It was uh, held at this place called the Isle of Wight. And so all the same people, most of the same people who did Woodstock were there. And so um, one story that I like to tell, which is in my book, but one story I like to tell is uh, Larry and I were backstage watching Jimi Hendrix and he had on these real tight pants and he made some move and his pants split right up, right up his butt. And so he had to uh, come and stand right next to Larry and I, and he had another pair of pants. I guess he was used to, you know, his clothes tearing. So he had another pair of pants waiting, and he put those on, and I was standing right there, you know. So I was standing between Larry Graham and Jimi Hendrix, and to and to me, you know, you know, what can I say? Who wouldn't want to be standing between the two of those um, musicians? So that was like one of my favorite memories I have of all time. Wow. So, uh, you know, it was great. It was wonderful. And I'm not going into a lot of detail, I know, because it's like too much stuff. But in my book, Deja Vu, Memoirs of a Funk Diva, mm -hmm. 
I go into more explanation about, I tell stories about things that happened, you know, while I was traveling with Sly and the Family Stone. But one thing about them that I can say, no matter what happened, it was always a family environment. You know, they really genuinely cared for one another and they uh, looked out for one another. And until the end, when it started getting, like I said, dark and kind of crazy, I really admired that part, the way that they just stuck together and, um, made the music for it that's still for the whole wide world that everybody is still listening to so you actually got to spend um quite a bit of time with them actually when you're in the studio too besides going out on the road no i don't really i don't really spend any time in in the studio with them just uh briefly just briefly so no uh larry was doing uh they were doing uh thank you and uh, so I was mixing Thank You. That was what was happening. He was mixing Thank You. And uh, Larry and I passed through the studio one night when he was doing that. But that's about it. Not really, no. Because they traveled so much. They stayed on the road so much. Now, I, I, I heard that. I think it's um, this one that you actually got to do a little background on. Is that right? Yes, um, which was another thing I always wanted to do. I was always waiting for, not hoping for, not wishing for anything bad to happen to anybody, but I was always waiting for the chance that I might be able to slide in there, you know, on stage with them and sing something because I knew every single song. I knew every single background part. And one of the times when we were touring, when I was touring with them in um, England, Rose got sick. So I thought it was finally going to be my chance, you know, to be on stage with Sly and the Family Stone. But Sly sent for Vet, his little sister. He sent for her, so she filled in for Rose. But this particular time that I actually did sing on Love and Hate was um, Sly was in the studio. He had a house in Bel Air. Um, he was recording. Larry and I were there. Larry was waiting to put a bass part on something. I don't know what, uh, can't remember. So we had been there for like maybe about a week <laughs> as Sly as I was waiting for Larry to do this one part. So Sly kept very erratic hours. Like he would be up like most of the time all night long and sleep like most of the day, most of the time. So the little room we were staying in, he came and knocked about three o'clock in the morning and said he needed some background vocals for this song that he was doing. And so it was love and hate. So Larry and I went in there about 3.15 <laughs> and put the background vocals on a love and hate. Wow, so that's, um, there's a riot going on, it's the album. Yeah. All time classic. There's a small picture of me on the back of that album, because you know it's a huge collage, so I'm actually on that too. I have on yellow, so uh, that That's was. A great. Dream. I was happy, happy, happy about that. So that dream came true. So Chuck, other than that, during those uh, few years after you know you got with uh, Larry Graham and were part of that scene, did you kind of put your um, singing on on hold, or were you doing anything else besides? Well, yeah, I did kind of when uh, when when uh, Larry was still on the road, he was producing a group. We had put together a group and it was called Hot Chocolate. So um, when he would come home off the road, we would practice, practice, practice. So Hot Chocolate consisted of uh, most of the original members of Graham Central Station. Um, so when Larry quit Sly and the Family Stone, he joined Hot Chocolate and Hot Chocolate became Grand Central Station. So what do you remember about that split when Larry finally decided he'd had enough and he left? What, what happened? That's in my book. The whole story is in my book. But it was... Um, it, was it was a scary time because Larry really felt like at the point that he left, he really felt like he was escaping Sly and the Family Stone. He felt like his life was in danger. So we like, there was a gig in LA um, that day at the uh, sports arena Coliseum, one of those, one of those two. And um, 
after the gig was over, he had heard rumors about, you know, there was a possibility that, you know, he might get hurt. So we escaped. We like jumped in the car and um, didn't even go to the airport and fly back to Oakland. We drove back to Oakland because he didn't even want to catch the airplane. So we drove back to Oakland and that's how, that's how it ended. It was really scary. It was ugly. Is it mostly uh, money, business issues, or personality issues, or creative differences? Or It was drugs. You know, cocaine had a way of making people paranoid, making people uh, delusional, uh, and so, and just making a situation evil. So that's what it was. It was all because of drugs. Um, Sly was, you know, paranoid. He was believing stuff that wasn't true about Larry. And um, so he was he was really like kind of out to get him and had henchmen, you know, working with him kind of out to get him. So it was mostly drugs is what it was because there was no foundation for any of the um, actions that um, they were taking toward Larry. There was no foundation for it. Hmm. nothing valid let me put it that way well that may have been you know like a lemon situation but um it was some sweet lemonade came out of it with Grand central station so isn't that funny the way that works absolutely it absolutely was because you know if that hadn't happened i don't know if larry would ever you know would have ever left so yeah he was like like really forced to to find a way to because also at the end there were a lot of lawsuits because um a lot of the gigs were like canceled because sly wouldn't come out the bathroom he'd be he'd be holed up in the bathroom with his buddies and stuff with the drugs and so when the promoters and the companies and stuff was sued they would sue everybody not just sly but everybody so the financial situation was bleak so at that time, you know, Larry really needed to do something about, you know, making a living. And how and when did you get the chocolate nickname? Uh, well, when Graham Central Station started, we decided that, I, I, and I'm not quite sure how this decision came about, but we just decided that everybody needed a nickname. So everybody had one, Willie Wilde, Herschel Happiness, uh, David Dynamite. So Larry always called me chocolate. I, I don't know why. It, it just came out the blue one day. So that stuck for me. Chocolate just stuck for me because that's Larry came up with that. What was Larry's nickname? Uh, well, he had many nicknames. He was the Funk Father. That was one that really, uh, and he was Brother Graham at one time. So he had many, but Funk Father was the one that kind of we used the most. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you got together with this um, record, the first one, were 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 all were all these guys part of um, Hot Chocolate, or did did one or two come from somewhere else? Mm -hmm. um, all of them except Butch. Butch now Butch he was the organ player. He was a friend of mine. We had gone to school together. So Larry decided he wanted to add another keyboard. So I called Butch. So Butch came, but. Beside but besides Butch and the the bass player, um, they were all original. But the first I almost forgot though. The very first version of a uh, Graham Central Station was with Larry, her show, myself, Greg Rico, and Neil Sean. That was the first version. Oh, so Greg was in there. Right. Yeah. That didn't last very very long though, because between uh, Larry, Greg, and Neil. That was too much ego at any t any one time in any given situation. So that didn't last. So then it lasted. I, it, but I do have some recordings when we would play um, locally in Oakland. So I do have like a couple of, we played in a couple of clubs. One was the Keystone, Berkeley, I believe, and another one. So I do have that down for prosperity um playing with neil and, and uh, greg but after that it's when the the graham central station that's on that album cover that's when we became it was i mean it's not 
don't know if it's fair to call it a debut really because you know larry had had so much experience with slides so in a way it's he kind of had a big advantage but i mean what a debut uh, it included um we've been waiting so long hair um ghetto um tell me what it is can you handle it i mean it's like a it's almost like a greatest hits collection you know yeah and that's my favorite album that is my favorite one because all those songs we have been playing them like when Larry left Sly and we started Grand Central Station, which I must say we started it. I'm a co-founding member. He because the the group was my group, Hot Chocolate, but he had to start all over again. We did proms, <laughs> you know. We did a uh, uh, a regular set. We were like the band at the a club called the Orphanage in San Francisco for a long time we did private parties we did all of that you know so and we did those songs that's on that album so we had been doing them for a while so by the time we did the album you know it was like you know we could do it you can't you couldn't get the same energy of course on the vinyl but we had been doing those songs for at least a good year before we did the album what was what was it like for you guys in the studio what was the creative process like you know who kind of um anyone kind of take the bull by the horns besides larry or what was the collaboration like in the studio um well yeah larry always had a producer of course but he always was uh he was i guess the assistant producer you want to say but he really was the producer whoever was producing they were doing what larry wanted them to do so um the only time that the rest of the group really had a chance to, um, you know, be able to collaborate was when we, everybody played their own parts, everybody did their own solo. So you could, do, of course, you came up with your own solos. You know, nobody told you what to play on your solos. Um, I came up with a lot of the lyrics, you know, on a lot of the songs, which I did not get credit for. So did some of the other members of the group. They came up with lyrics for the songs that they did not get credit for. And, um, but as far as actually being in the studio, Larry was the one that like actually took that part over and handled that. Was he a real perfectionist with like the sounds and, and the way everything would be? Yes, he definitely was. He definitely was. He because you know they would the sounds would be in his head and stuff, and so he would keep by any means necessary uh, until he finally got the sound that he wanted musically and vocally. Because a lot of our vocals, the background vocals and stuff, were like like really intricate harmonies and arrangements and stuff. So yeah, he was a perfectionist. Which was fine because I love that because I'm a perfectionist too. So you couldn't rehearse enough for me. And sometimes, you know, unlike today, um, when you were doing vocals and stuff and as you're doing harmonies and stuff, you would have to do it over and over and over again till everybody hit the right parts and everybody was in pitch with one another at the same time. So you could like be in the studio, like, trying to get one part, one harmony part for hours. And also the group, the music, they would all come and play at the same time in the studio too, as opposed to playing one instrument at a time and putting it all together. Larry would do that sometimes, but he liked for everybody to be in the studio and everybody playing the songs at the same time. How would you decide when you were gonna take the lead vocal versus Larry, um, you know, how did you make those decisions? Okay, Larry made those decisions. <laughs> and um, so, and he made those decisions based on the fact that, you know, it was Graham Central Station. So he was concerned about the, you know, making sure that everyone knew it was Graham Central Station and being out in front. So I would get a solo, maybe two solos on an album, maybe. Maybe. And as far as the uh, the vocal arrangements goes, as far as the participation of the rest of the, the group vocally, Larry just basically followed the same structure as Sly did. You know, everybody would take a turn, you know, so he basically stuck with that structure. So try to keep it a little bit democratic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. You quit. <laughs> so 
tell us, Chocolate, what is what is a funk box? So I think the funk box might have been one of the first drum machines made. Sly used it on some of his stuff too. Um, I think when Larry was still in the group, but he, he used it heavily after Larry left. So it's a drum machine. It's a, called a Rhythm King, and it can either be played automatically where the, where the beats could automatically loop, or the buttons had every sound of the percussion and the drums and stuff on it, and the buttons could be played individually, manually, and that's what I did. I just played, um, you know, I just played the beats and the rhythms with the buttons individually. So you just had a blast with it, right? Yep, I did. And, you know, the reason why I was playing it was because I did not want to be just another chick singer. You know what I'm saying? The stand up there singing and playing the hitting the tambourine every once in a while. I wanted to be a part of the fabric of the music. So I'm, I was like, Larry, I want to play something besides the tambourine. So that's what we came up with. We came up with the funk box. And so, yeah, that was great. That was awesome. Because I was able to get inside the music with everybody else. Well, that might have been, whether realized or not, some of that Rose influence, because you kind of admired the way she was part of the band. Exactly. She and yeah, Cynthia. Exactly. That's right. I want to be inside of it, just like Rose and Cynthia were. That's right. So were you... Um, happy with the reception that the first record got and that the sales that it had or did you expect more where was your head at you know i was not even thinking about that i was not thinking about the business part whatsoever i was just living a dream as far as being able to i never knew that i could possibly get as far as i was as quickly as i did being with this group so just everything was moving so fast and it was all i could do as being the only female in the situation and you know back in those days there weren't very many females in the funk uh genre so a lot of times i would be the only female it would be like uh like we'd be on the road, it'd be like three or four different groups, right? Ohio players, Isley Brothers, three or four different groups. I'd be the only female. So that was uh, interesting in itself, just trying to navigate, although it wasn't as hard because I was with Larry. So that fended off a lot of uh, nonsense and shenanigans. So that was a good part, but just moving so fast, just always traveling, always rehearsing, all that. Being with Larry, I was trusting. He had a manager, Natalie Nielsen. So I was trusting that between Larry and Natalie that, um, you know, the business would be taken care of. Everybody would be treated fairly. So I, I didn't even trip off of it at first. I didn't started. I didn't start to notice what was going on until later when the, the group, everybody else in the group started noticing that, um, it was something uneven about the way the money situation and the financial situation was going down, you know, in comparison to what Larry was doing and the rest of the group. Although I was with Larry, still, I was making my own money. You know what I'm saying? I'm supposed to be. So it, it, it soon became apparent that something was wrong. So by the time that happened, though, we have been out there and doing it for about a couple of years. So. Just having fun, just, you know, not being concerned with anything except funking it up every chance I got. Just just being in that funk zone all the time. Yeah. Well, you guys did four records in like three years. I mean, you were hitting it hard. Um, so I'm sure there wasn't much time to think about between all that recording time and the touring time. It was just a whirlwind, I'm guessing. Exactly. Exactly right. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> but it was fun though. I loved every second of it. And it, it was wonderful. You know, it's just a it's just too bad that, you know, anytime, you know, large sums of money get introduced gets introduced into a situation that greed immediately sets in. And this has been going on forever in the music business. But you would think that at a that sooner or later that somebody would like like stop and um put an end to that vicious circle, but no, that vicious cycle, I mean, but no, it didn't happen. So that was really the um, the reason why Grand Central Station 
began to fall apart because of greed, because Larry ripped the whole group off, trying to keep all the money for himself. Mm. Yeah, you're right. There's way too many stories like that in the uh, business. Isn't that sad? That is so sad. When will it end? You would think it would end. Um, What was it like hearing your voice on the radio for the first time? Tell me what that experience was like. You know what? Um, I can't even, I don't even have words. I don't even have words. It was like uh, I was outside of myself. Just just let me put it that way. I don't have words. You can't explain it. I can't. Exp- I don't even have words for my whole experience while I was with Grand Central Station because it was just surreal. Uh, I was like living outside of myself. But I can tell you this: after I left a Grand Central Station and um, pursued a solo career and finally did my own album now that was an experience because now this was because with larry i had a um solo now and then like i said but none of my solos got played on the radio you know where i was actually the lead singer so when my album came out and i actually heard myself and it was my song i was driving down the street had to pull over had to pull over and started crying (laughs) <laughs> you know, happy tears of joy. <laughs> well, you know, uh, living in Los Angeles, they certainly played a lot of tracks off of um, "Ain't Nobody Doubted." I mean, including "I Can't Stand the Rain." So, um, and of course, you know, you can hear um, you on, on the jam and those and um, intro. They played a lot too. So, although you weren't the sole focus, you did definitely get your little spotlights in there. Here and there. Yeah. 